They found out that I had hemophilia when I was two. This is the story of Jonathan Hill. John rolls a death save. A young boy who discovered Dungeons and Dragons gave him a life filled with adventure. In D&D, you can't win unless you work together as a team. Surrounded by his best friends, John escaped his hospital bed for worlds beyond imagination. I think one of the things the readers will find is how important my friends are to me. I think you're ready to become a dungeon master. This is Blood of the Paladin podcast. Hi, it's Catherine, and today we are diving deep into the realm of Dungeons and Dragons. In our previous episodes, you got to know Jonathan, the beginning of his story, and how D&D came into his life. You met the graphic novel version of his friends in the story episode, but today we're going to meet them in real life. We'll hear about their trials and tribulations, their conquests, loyalty, and hardships on this episode, episode three of Blood of the Paladin. So we've got a few people on the show today. We of course have Jonathan with us once again, and we are joined by Rebecca, his wife. And then there is the core group of friends and D&D players who are featured in the graphic novel, Ian, Mike, and Dan. It's a lot to keep track of. So why don't we go around and have everyone introduce themselves? Tell us how you met Jonathan Hill and maybe a favorite character you've played in Dungeons & Dragons. Sure, Catherine. Hello, everyone again. My name is Jonathan Hill. I'm the author. And as far as a favorite D&D character, I would say the first character I played, which was a paladin... His name probably wasn't Bitor at that time, but this character in the graphic novel is definitely based on that character. Rebecca, why don't you go next? I'm Rebecca Hill. I am the wife of the famous Jonathan Hill. And we met a few times. Technically, we went to high school together, but I was a sophomore and Jonathan was a senior. So I knew who he was, but he didn't know who I was. And then we had a mutual friend group, most of which are present here. I was part of a D&D campaign for like five minutes, but the thrill of that was that the famous Jonathan Dungeon Master created my character, and that was a really big deal at that time. Okay, Mike, you're up next. Mike Bass, I met John junior year in high school, so 34-ish years ago. That's a very long time. I'd say my favorite character is much more recent, but it's a warlock that has a sword, which is possessed, which drives me to cause more mayhem than I would normally like. And that's saying a lot. I'm Dan Bass. In case you can't tell, Mike is my brother. So I met most of these folks really through him because I was living in San Francisco in the mid 80s and driving up to Novato to stay over at my mom's house and met all these guys. D&D wise, I was almost always a paladin too. I was very excited to see myself featured a couple of times and some laughed out loud a few times reading the novel. So I'm looking forward to talking about that more. But uh, I couldn't imagine life without these people. And Ian? Uh, Yeah, my name is Ian Welter. I met John a long time ago in high school. We really started getting close, like all good friends, when John started busting my balls on a daily basis uh, about my outfit choices in high school. So (laughs) really had a mutual interest in D&D. We started playing a lot at that point. And I think my favorite character is still a bard from John's campaign. Many years ago, yeah, Dan, bards. I play a lot of annoying bards in D&D. And I think that one epitomized the annoying bard because John gave him a loot that had stone skin that could cast on it. And he would just taunt monsters to hit him and never do anything else the entire combat. But they would hit him and do no damage. Can I ask you how your first D&D happened. Who was the person who had the idea to play the game? How did it all begin? It's like a hundred years ago. I'm a couple of years older than most of these guys here. And I think it was seventh grade. I got the first original blue box, first ever set, but didn't really know anybody was living up in my grandparents feeling like a flowers in the attic, slowly poisoned kid they wanted to get rid of. That's why I spent a lot of time up in Marin County with these guys. But honestly, we played a lot of board games, but I don't remember. I'm going to defer to John and Ian's memory as to how we all got started together. Well, I started playing D&D in like sixth grade and by playing, like hanging around with friends, rolling characters. And I didn't know John at the time 
or any of these guys. But I think we actually in high school kind of got together and played some board games before we started. I think we played board games at Andy's house. And I know you guys played Middle Earth role playing game two at that time. And it kind of organically just grew like, oh, you played indie, you played indie. You... And then we kind of just realized we all played and we're like, heck, let's get together and figure it out. Is that right, John? Is that correct? Yeah. When we were writing the script for the graphic novel, I have a, a bigger group of support, uh, Catherine, a, slightly larger than this. So we had to kind of collapse some characters. So some of the narrative is where Ian's doing things. It's, it's probably actually Andy. Andy's the one that introduced me to D&D. But then later in life, Ian was so critical to my life. So I went ahead and kind of merged those two characters together. But Andy was the first real dungeon master I knew, you know, who helped us build characters. And Ian's right. I think the first campaign we did was set in Middle Earth using Dungeons and Dragons rules. That was where I built my paladin. Yeah, I think, John, you and I like kind of became the default DMs. Like I would DM for a bit and then John would DM and then I and we kind of switched between it a lot. I love DMing actually probably more than playing. I always volunteer to do it, too. So. So I, before I met any of you, except Dan, I went to this really hippie school in San Francisco called Synergy. Um, I remember buying the box set and reading the books. And I don't remember at what point I started getting Dragon Magazine. I never played. I just read all the stuff and would make characters and think about it. But I didn't get to play until I think you were my first DM, John. Yeah, I remember standing in the local bookstore or game store for three hours just kind of memorizing the player's handbook and DM's handbook. I'm sure they got tired of me. I would have stolen it for you. <laughs> I had to replace all my books because my mom thought the D and D uh, was a uh, demon spawn from uh, the eighties. So she like got all my books and one day I got them from school and they were all in the garbage and gone. And I was like devastated because Pat Robertson from the 700 club decided to <laughs> make his announcement that D and D was the devil that day or whatever it was. And by gosh, she was going to get rid of them all. I think you said you're, Mom felt a presence in the garage, and that was it. All your stuff was gone. <laughs> it's like a yes. culling of your because the because you know they they actually we were summoning demons in the garage uh, instead of playing D and D. Of course, yeah. My family was in a religious cult too at that time, and I remember sitting in the front row listening to the sermon, and they started talking about D and D, how it teaches us to worship devils and stuff like that. And I'm like, man, I'm out of here. This, I know this is not true because I'm doing it. <laughs> Why do you think that D&D is so popular? Like, why do you think it's lasted through time and that you guys keep going back to it? This might be too real for your podcast, but a big part of it for me back then was escape from the difficulties of the lives that we live. Dan and I, actually all of us, I think went through a lot of challenges and difficult situations. And it was really great to pretend to be something powerful and in control of yourself and, and able to fight and win and be something other than the world you were living in at the time. I used to work with kids at this LARP camp, which was very similar to Dungeons and Dragons in terms of fantastical adventures and heroics and stuff like that. Remember Brennan Mulligan from our first episode? He's a creator and dungeon master of Dimension 20. He had a great story about his time working with children at an LARP camp which is a live action role-playing camp. Here's what he had to say. And we were working with young kids and very, and I think this is exactly the experience that D&D provides. You, yes, it is, it is fictional, right? Like, yes, it's fictional. However, I, I remember playing, you know, big old monster king. I was just some like horned demon charging out of the woods during this LARP thing. And this little 13 year old kid. And again, it like, even anything else aside, this is a 13 year old kid, about twice as big as this kid, IRL. And then in the game, you know, he's playing a human warrior. I'm playing a monster with this huge foam ax. I come roaring out of the woods. And this kid turns around, sees me. You see him like stutter stop for a second. It's like monster. And then draws a sword and jumps in front of his friends. There is no way to underline the significance of getting a chance to wire your brain in that way. Because even though there's a part of his brain that knew we're playing a game, that's a foam ax, it's all groovy. Most people never get a chance to practice that type of physical bravery 
unless they're in a real life or death situation. Similarly with moments where a, a kid has, has to, a chance to practice emotional bravery, to speak up for themselves in a moment, to say to the villain, you know what, buddy, you can go take a hike, right? To have those moments where you are standing up for what you believe in, where you're making a difficult choice, where you're dealing with a sorrow. I, you know, I've told this story many times before, but I had a moment, we had a, a PC death in a long running home game that went by for years and eventually the surviving party members got high enough level that they could plane shift to the underworld and travel there. And they found the spirit of this character who had passed away and the, the player reprised their fallen character. Mm -hmm. And one of the PCs who had lived could have saved that person on a nat 20 back when they died. They rolled a 19. And they lived with that 19 for you know three years of their real life. And when we finally got to the underworld, they looked at this other character and said this thing, said this thing. We were playing around Christmas time. So there's like a Christmas tree in my family home in New York. And we were all sitting on the carpet. And this person looked and just went like, I'm so sorry I couldn't save you. And cried wow. a real tear. And you watched that he had been living with that, how close he came to almost saving him. And the other character was like, it wasn't your fault. And this moment of catharsis, if you, I mean, like the amount of therapy sessions it would take to get to where we got to, where you're dealing with that catharsis, like it's, it's, uh, it's really beautiful. The power this game has, its ability to fuse fiction with reality, to build confidence as a youth and strengthen friendships over the course of a lifetime is indeed beautiful. We'll be hearing from Brennan again soon, but I want to jump back in with Jonathan and the gang to talk about how D&D has played a role in their adult lives. It's really neat for me to see it come back around because all our age group are parents now and they're teaching their kids to play and the kids are loving it. And it's something that's really neat to see a bonding between their parents and the kids, mostly fathers, but yeah fathers and kids and our kids group have a lot of girls that are into the D&D now too so it's kind of neat to see it come back around what the nerds in 80s a late 80s loved is big now comic books uh, mm -hmm. superhero stuff and d and is part of that and D&D &D, like Mike said is a great escape and it's also a great creative outlet you know after a while everybody grows up and different people start families and moves around says you well grows up physically how about that <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but then, you know, I, I thought I was done with it. I didn't want it posted on my Facebook because I didn't want the different groups of friends seeing all that stuff. John's notorious for that. <laughs> but then when John's sick and I'm not sure how long he's going to be with us, it's like, well, John wants to play. Well, heck, I'm going to play. And so I kind of changed my thoughts and pulled me really back in. Once I got pulled back in, now I got another group down here that plays, playing with these guys online. Because now, of course, there's the internet, where in the olden days, we had to use a phone with a wire attached to it or walkie or CBs and walkie talkies. I've only figured out recently that like when I was a kid, I would plan out my character. I would have all the stats in my head when I'm trying to go to sleep and not wanting to think about life. I would think about my character and what do I take at level two and level three and level four and, and doing the math for all that and what makes it the strongest. And now at work, I do something similar in that I think through all the different situations at work of a security vulnerability or whatever, something that I want to apply. And it's the exact same type of math and thought process of if this, then that, that goes through in my head. And it's just, I think it prepared me for a lot of things. I would love to talk more about that, about how the challenges and conflicts in the game sometimes mirrored real life or helped you work something out, maybe that you didn't realize that you were working out throughout the game, but actually helped you in real life. You guys have been playing for so long and so many landmarks in your personal lives have happened. And how has that worked yourself through the game as well? And being able to have these personal relationships outside the game and then bringing them in the game as well. Well, you know, one of the things that has always struck me about Dungeons and Dragons is it's collective or community storytelling. You're telling a story together. The DM may set the stage, but... It's the players and their characters that bring the game to life. You know, one of the big lessons I learned was in D&D, &D, you can't win unless you work together as a team. 
you can't beat the dragon unless you work together effectively as a team and trust your teammates. And I think that helped strengthen our friendships to the point where I felt comfortable sharing some of my medical challenges with my friends and they could rally around me and they've always been there for me. And I think some of that started with Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, I mean, I think for sure, you know, when we would DM and you'd set a barrier in front of the players, just sitting back and listening to them work out how they were going to overcome that challenge, what they were going to do to overcome that challenge. And honestly, as a DM, thinking how you could kind of counteract that in a slight way that might not be in the story that you wrote, but might enhance the story. So being able to kind of change things a little bit on the fly to give it just a little bit more of a challenge for the players. You could apply that to life. Like Mike said, you kind of game it all out in your head. And then you realize as everyone's in front of it, they've already figured out how to get past it. So now really easily. So as a DM, you have to kind of level some stuff above it. So it's a little more challenging. So, I mean, that can be applied to a lot of things in life. Uh, you know, my work, same as Mike's, you have to kind of game out a lot of different things too. So I think it was a big stepping stone for us as, as kids to kind of be able to grow that way because we applied it a lot, all of us in how we live. So I would say one of the things I learned to do is to think like your opponent. I go back to this <laughs> stupid movie, Firefox, where he has to think in Russian. But when Ian is the DM, I have to think in Ian. That's a dark place. Don't go there, Mike. If I think in Ian, then I can solve the problem much faster than, than if I try to think just as me, which applies directly to the work that I do and how I affect life. It's not, what do I do in this response situation? It's, what is this other person's motivation and how they're talking to me that allows me to better deal with it? So if I think in Ian or I think in John, it allows me to solve the problem because I know, ah, oh, John's snarky. It's this painting in the background that I just have to mess with and that solves the problem. And it's working, Ian, <laughs> in our current campaign. <laughs> what you're saying is I got to think like Mike more. No, I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a dangerous place to go. <laughs> Ian, you were about to talk about this earlier, but I know myself personally, I started playing just around the time of quarantine. It has been a really great escapism for me and to be able to play with my friends and learn a brand new world. And so I'm really interested in all of your takes of how it's grown now and the online presence and also just how it could help someone right now with social distancing and quarantine as well. So like when we grew up, you know, no internet, right? Well, you know, just starting in the ni early 90s, but in the 80s, we would all have to go to each other's houses and play. So it was a big deal to socialize that way. I mean, like Mike said, we might have gone to parties. Um, my kids were in the room, so I can't talk about it too much. But we would also get together on weekends and sometimes play D&D &D all weekend long. And it was, you know, a huge bonding experience. When we grew up, we all moved to different areas, right? So we weren't able to play as much, but with the advent of the internet now, it basically removes that barrier. So you can get with your friends and, you know, if you want to set up video to do video chat at the same time, and there's virtual dice roll rollers and everything else that lets you actually experience it in a very similar way. I mean, yes, you're not right next to each other, but with COVID, that's a good thing now. It allows people who are trapped or feel trapped in a home or an apartment or something else to have an outlet of not just creativity, but have an outlet of being socially, uh, you know, interacting with people and having fun doing it. I think it's a huge thing now. COVID has probably cemented it even more because all these people who are playing it now, you know, whenever it's over, they'll still want to play it that itch is going to need to be scratched. There are some things in the old days, which we couldn't do anyway now. Like I vividly remember being at my apartment one or two in the morning. Let's take a break and walk across the street to 7-Eleven and get yeah. massive, massive drinks and cheapo hot dogs and walking back across. Becca was there. Walking back across the street to play and trying to make sure uh, Mrs. Landlord isn't peeking out of her apartment and seeing too many people enter our room and yelling at us. It wasn't people, Dan. It was girls, remember? She would yeah, yell yeah, at us well, girls never. coming to our department. I can't imagine that was ever a problem. <laughs> well, you're wrong. Wow, that, that, digs, that digs deep, Mike. I'm, I'm hurt now. I care. I'm not like the others. <laughs> As we are wrapping up this episode, I would love to hear how you all reacted or felt when you heard that Jonathan was going to 
make his life story into this graphic novel, into this story that others would be able to listen to and learn from? What was the group reaction? I was all in. It was super encouraging. I just asked him to be kind to me because, you know, I can be sort of a jerk sometimes. So, but his story is such an incredible story. And I'm honored to have like basically been there for a large, large portion of it. And it's such an incredible story that it'll allow people to realize they can overcome what's in front of them. If they just, as John has said many times, put one foot in front of the other and just keep pushing forward, you can get to the end, uh, whatever that, you know, positive end is. I know he loves storytelling and he's a massively vivid imagination. So I was very excited to hear or to see what was going to come out of that story. I, I've always been amazed at John's resilience and attitude and, and ability, even when he's down, to be positive and to move forward. It's affected me in how I think about things and life. And so while I was, I don't think skeptical is the right word, but just kind of dismissive maybe about the idea of it, because I just thought, yeah, it's just one more, it's just a thing, it doesn't really matter. Until I read it, it was clear that the impact that it could have on people, especially young people starting out the journey that he went through. It just reminds me of what an ass I was and I wish I was more encouraging and supportive of the, the act. And I feel bad about that, but look what he's done. The book for me personally, though, it was interesting that it really added depth to a lot of those things. Cause I was there for a lot of these, but mm -hmm. it adds a lot more because now I'm seeing more behind. You know, it's like the, watching the behind the scenes of this real life story. So it's, definitely hits home that there was more to what was going on than I was aware, you know, more to what he was going through, yeah. even though I was there for piece of, lots of major pieces of it, I guess. For me, John's, we'll call it a near-death experience. He was very, very near death. That that was so traumatic for so long, and there's huge chunks of life that he barely remembers. For me, I thought, you know, this is great while you're kind of healing and reevaluating your new lease on life. This will be a fantastic creative outlet for you. I thought it was a great processing tool because not very many people have that opportunity to go through being that close to the end and then having this absolute turnaround new lease on life. But I don't know, maybe John knew, but I don't know if any of the rest of us knew really how far this was going to go. And when it started to take off, it really took off. And that was exciting. So when we do the Netflix series, who's going to play John? That's the, that's the question. Kevin Bacon. <laughs> I think Ewan McGregor at this point. Lots of foreshadowing here for the next chapter of the audio version, which happens to be our next episode. Thanks so much to Jonathan and Rebecca, Mike, Ian, and Dan for being on this episode today. And of course, Brennan for popping in as well. Coming up next, like I said, is part two of our three-part audio journey. And then we'll be back again next week to talk more with Jonathan about his journey through the AIDS crisis of the 1980s, his HIV diagnosis, and how disclosure and advocacy work their way into his life. Blood of the Paladin is a Bloodstream Media production made possible by Biomarin. Hosted by Catherine Chen Lerner and Jonathan Hill and adapted for your ears by me, Joshua Sterling Bragg. The graphic novel Blood of the Paladin was written by Jonathan Hill with Ryan Geelan, based on Jonathan's true life story. Special thanks to the editors that helped me put this together, Allison Stoney and Christina Penny, and to the incredible cast and crew at Believe Limited that helped bring this story to life. Episodes of this podcast were directed by me, Joshua Sterling Gregg, produced by Greg Holdsman and Catherine Chen Lerner, and executive produced by Ryan Geelan. If you want to hear more podcasts like this one, check out bloodstreammedia.com, where you can find podcasts about bleeding disorders, gene therapy, community stories, menstruation, pain and how we deal with it, and so, so, so much more. That's bloodstreammedia.com. <laughs>